and welcome to Tala Talks NICU. Today we're going to go through part two of our series of videos on jaundice. And today, you know, first of all, go back and watch the first one, otherwise this won't make a lot of sense. But today we're going to be talking about the difference between immune and non-immune hemolysis as well as non-hemolytic types of hyperbilirubinemia. So first of all, why do we even care about this? Well, if it is a hemolytic cause of hyperbilirubinemia, it means, by definition, hemolysis means breakdown of the red blood cells. So a hemolytic cause of the hyperbilirubinemia means that those red blood cells are breaking down at a much faster rate than we would expect them to. We care about that because that immediately means that the babies are at a higher risk of developing a higher level of bilirubin. It isn't just a tiny bit of dehydration or like a little bit of a bleed somewhere and then once the body gets rid of that, then we'll be over the bilirubin issues. No, with a hemolysis, it can continue for some time and the bilirubin is continuing to be produced at a high level. So generally it's very important to differentiate whether a baby has hyperbilirubinemia from a hemolytic reason or from a non-hemolytic reason. So if you look at the previous video then, or you remember from the previous video, then one of the things that can cause a very high bilirubin level is if those red blood cells are breaking down at a faster rate. So the red blood cells breaking down at a faster rate is called hemolysis. So we can have hemolytic reasons for having a high bilirubin or we can have non-hemolytic reasons for having a high bilirubin. Now the hemolytic reasons, again, the breaking down of the red blood cells, can be further divided into immune reasons and non-immune reasons. So the immune reasons, which I'm going to go over on a completely separate video because it's so critical that you understand it for just taking care of uh, really all babies in the unit. But the immune reasons, the most ones that we see most commonly are like the ABO incompatibility or the RH incompatibility or any other abnormalities between blood types between the mummy and the baby. And again, I'm going to go over that in the second video. So. The immune reasons for hemolysis are basically when the mommy produces antibodies and they cross the placenta and they attach onto the baby's little red blood cells and cause the red blood cell to break down. So again, I'm going to go over that in the next video. The non-immune causes of hemolysis are basically when something is wrong either with the way that the energy is formed within the red blood cell, so basically the red blood cell just kind of runs out of energy, or there's something wrong with the membrane of the red blood cell that causes it to break down at a much faster rate than it should. So the non-immune causes of hemolysis, kind of the two most common categories, are an enzymatic defect in the red blood cell. And you really don't have to remember these categories. I just want you to understand this concept of hemolysis versus non-hemolysis. So the two most common are G6PD deficiency and pyruvate kinase deficiency. G6PD deficiency is actually the most common enzyme deficiency in the human population. So you are definitely going to come across this at some point in your careers. The deficiency is most common in Mediterranean as well as Southeast Asian population, as well as honestly areas that are like endemic to malaria. So like a lot of Africa as well has a higher risk of, of G6PD deficiency. It is an X-linked disease, which means that it is the boys that suffer from it a lot more than the girls. A lot of really weird things have to happen for a girl to actually be diagnosed with G6PD deficiency just because she has two X's. So if you have a male from a Mediterranean country with an extremely high bilirubin level and it doesn't seem to be immune, then one of the things that you should be thinking of is a G6PD deficiency. Pyruvate kinase deficiency is also an enzymatic deficiency. It's actually inherited in a recessive way, but that is also one of the things that you should be thinking about. The other sets of non-immune hemolytic hyperbilirubinemia are caused by red blood cell membrane abnormalities. Um, and the two most common that we talk about are spherocytosis, 
and electrocytosis. So spherocytosis is when the red blood cells, instead of having that kind of nice concave shape, are actually really, really round. And it really is a diagnosis that can be made on like a pathological smear. So you have a really, really high bilirubin level um, and you send the smear to the lab and the pathologist can look at it and be like, well, this is kind of 60% spherocyte. So this is very consistent with spherocytosis. Interestingly, spherocytosis is inherited in an autosomal dominant way. So very often, if you do have a kid that you're suspecting with spherocytosis, you can ask the parents, did they have issues with hyperbilirubinemia? Have they had their spleen removed at some point in life? Do they have any other kind of concerns like that in the family? So I'm just going to mark this up here so you can remember that G6PDX. Remember that G6PD is excellent. So it happens in boys. And then the other membrane abnormality is the elliptocytosis. So also kind of a membrane defect. All of those can cause the red blood cell to be hemolyzed or to kind of be burst at a much higher rate than a red blood cell normally should be. Now let's go over the non-hemolytic causes of hyperbilirubinemia. So in these cases, again, the red blood cells are surviving for the normal amount of time, but there is an increased level of free, indirect bilirubin in the blood. So logically, going back to the first video, if you have a very high hematocrit, so if you have polycythemia, if your hematocrit is 70, then even as some of that red blood cells break down, as all red blood cells break down eventually, you're going to end up with a higher bilirubin. So if you have a baby with polycythemia, you have to be more concerned about that. Another obvious cause would be if you had a bleed anywhere. So if you have a cephalohematoma, or there's an intracranial hemorrhage on a preemie baby, or you have a subcapsular hemorrhage in the liver, or baby got really, really bruised being pulled out of the mummy, then all of those are going to cause, obviously, increased blood breakdown. All those areas of blood collection outside the red blood cells have to be broken down, and eventually that will result in increase bilirubin. So let's add bleeds. Probably one of the most common reasons that we see of non-hemolytic hyperbilirubinemia is breastfeeding jaundice. Now I'm going to go over breastfeeding jaundice at the same time that I talk about uh, breast milk jaundice because this is something that people love to talk about on exams and it is really important that you kind of understand uh, the whole concept. So breastfeeding jaundice normally happens within the first couple of days of life and really what it is is that the baby is just not getting enough volume. So the milk supply hasn't come down from the mummy and the baby just kind of has a little bit of dehydration actually. So the baby gets dry, isn't peeing as much, so the bilirubin that's in the blood is kind of more concentrated. Not just that, but the baby isn't pooping as much. So the whole intestinal peristalsis hasn't started, so none of that bilirubin, even from the bile system, is now kind of being drained out. So it just kind of stops the whole enzymatic, the whole process is just kind of stunted and so the bilirubin is not being conjugated as fast. And that happens really within the first couple of days of life. So these babies are generally breastfed, they have a high bilirubin, and then very often if you check other lab work, they can also end up with a high sodium level because they are dehydrated, as well as a low bicarb, so a low HCO3. So that's breastfeeding jaundice in the first few days of life. Now, breast milk jaundice happens at kind of a couple of weeks of life. And that is when the bilirubin stays at a very high level in babies who are being breastfed still. It's not a dehydration thing, they're gaining weight, they are not having any issues with urinating or with passing stool, but the jaundice levels are staying kind of in the high teens, maybe even higher than that. 
Nobody's exactly certain in what way breast milk slows down the bilirubin metabolism, but it's thought that there is a substance in breast milk that actually works directly on the glucuronyl transferase enzyme. And if you remember, that was the enzyme that conjugated the indirect bilirubin to the direct bilirubin in the liver. So if that enzyme is working slower, then you're going to have a buildup of that indirect bilirubin. So that is the difference between breast milk and breastfeeding jaundice. Breast milk jaundice is thought to be just kind of a slowing down of the whole enzymatic process, whereas breastfeeding jaundice is really a jaundice of kind of dehydration. And then there are a whole bunch of causes of indirect hyperbilirubinemia that are really a lot more rare. Out of the kind of really rare ones, probably the most common is hypothyroidism, which again is just really slowing down all the metabolism of the bilirubin. There are also some um, inherited or new mutations, so kind of genetic abnormalities in specifically that glucuronyl transferase. So there are some diseases where patients actually lack that enzyme or the activity of that enzyme is really decreased. And these are babies with Krigler-Najjar or Gilbert syndrome. And these babies can end up with really, really high bilirubin with really no obvious explanation. A lot of these do end up needing double volume exchange transfusions and stuff. But I would say that easily the most common causes that we see of hyperbilirubinemia, um, especially in the NICU, would be from bleeds, breastfeeding, jaundice, and then maybe some immune hemolysis. Okay, so I hope that you learned something today. Um, please go back and watch the first video if you haven't done that yet. And stick around so that you can watch video three and four. In the meantime, remember to like and subscribe and to answer all the multiple choice questions. Thank you.